The departure of the Anunnaki gods from Earth was a drama-filled event replete with theophanies, phenomenal occurrences, divine uncertainties, and human quandary. Incredibly, the departure is neither surmised nor speculative. It is amply documented. The evidence comes to us from the Near East as well as from the Americas, and some of the most direct records of the ancient gods' departure from Earth come to us from Haran. The testimony is not hearsay. It consists of eyewitness reports, among them the prophet Ezekiel. The reports are included in the Bible, and they were inscribed on stone columns, text dealing with the miraculous events leading to the accession to the throne of Babylon's last king. Haran nowadays is a sleepy town in eastern Turkey, just a few miles from the Syrian border. It is surrounded by crumbling walls from the Islamic times, its inhabitants dwelling in beehive-shaped mud huts. The traditional well where Jacob met Rachel is still there among the sheep meadows outside the town, with the purest, naturally cool water one can imagine. But in earlier days, Haran was a flourishing commercial, cultural, religious, and political center. It was a city that had been from Sumerian times on, an Ur away from Ur cult center of the moon god Nanar, also known as Sin. Abraham's family ended up residing there because his father Terah was an omen priest first in Nippur, then in Ur, and finally in Nanar or Sin's temple in Haran. After the demise of Sumer by the evil wind, Nanar and his spouse Ningal made their home and headquarters in Haran. Though Nanar was not Enlil's firstborn legal heir, that rank belonged to Ninurta, he was the firstborn of Enlil and his spouse Ninlil, a firstborn on earth. Gods and men greatly adored Nanar, or Sin, and his spouse. The hymns in their honor in Sumer's glorious times and the lamentations about the desolation of Sumer in general, and Ur in particular, reveal the great love and admiration of the people for this divine couple. It was in the ruins of the city's great Nanar temple, the Ihulhul, which means house of double joy, that archaeologists discovered four stone columns, or stelae, that once stood in the temple, one at each corner of the main prayer hall. The inscriptions on the stelae revealed that two were erected by the temple's high priestess, Adaguppi, and two by her son, Nabu Naid, the last king of Babylon. With an evident sense of history and as a trained temple official, Adaguppi provided in her inscriptions precise dates for the astounding events that she had witnessed. The dates have been verified by modern scholars and it is certain that she was born in 649 BCE and lived through the reigns of several Assyrian and Babylonian kings passing on at the ripe old age of 104. Here is what she wrote on her last stela concerning the first of a series of amazing events. It was in the 16th year of Nabu-Pilassar, king of Babylon, when Sin, lord of the gods, became angry with his city and his temple and went up to heaven, and the city and the people in it went to ruin. The 16th year of Nabu-Pilassar was 610 BCE. That was also the same year Babylonian forces captured Haran from the remnants of the Assyrian royal family and when Egypt decided to seize the space-related sites. It was then, Adaguppi wrote, that an angered sin, removing his protection and himself from the city, packed up and went up to heaven. While other survivors fled, Adaguppi stayed on, daily, without ceasing, by day and night for months, for years she kept vigil in the ruined temple. Morning, she forsook the dresses of fine wool, took off jewelry, wore neither silver nor gold, relinquished perfumes and sweet-smelling oils. As a ghost roaming the abandoned shrine, in a torn garment I was clothed. I came and went noiselessly, she wrote. Then, in the desolate sacred precinct, she found a robe that had once belonged to sin. To the despondent priestess, this fine was an omen from the god. Suddenly, he had given her a physical presence of himself. She could not take her eyes off the sacred garb, 
not daring to touch it except by taking hold of its hem. As if the God himself was there to hear her, she prostrated herself and in prayer and in humility uttered a vow. If you would return to your city, all the black-headed people would worship your divinity. Black-headed people was a term by which the Sumerians used to describe themselves, and the employment of the term by the high priestess some 1,500 years after Sumer was no more was full of significance. She was telling the god that were he to come back, he would be restored to lordship as in the days of old, become again the lord god of a restored Sumer and Akkad. To achieve that, Adagupi offered her god a deal. If he would return and then use his divine powers to make her son nabu Naid the next imperial king, reigning over all the Babylonian and Assyrian domains, nabu Naid would restore the Temple of Sin not only in Haran but also in Ur, and would proclaim the worship of Sin as the state religion in all the lands of the black-headed people. One night the god appeared to her in a dream and accepted her proposal. Adaguppi recorded that the moon god liked the idea, quote, Sin, lord of the gods of heaven and earth, for my good doings looked upon me with a smile. He heard my prayers, he accepted my vow. The wrath of his heart calmed. Toward Ihulhu, his temple in Haran, the divine residence in which his heart rejoiced, he became reconciled, and he had a change of heart, End quote. The god accepted the deal. Sin, Lord of the gods, looked with favor upon my words. Nabu Naid, my only son, issue of my womb to the kingship he called, the kingship of Sumer and Akkad. All the lands from the border of Egypt, from the upper sea to the lower sea, in his hands he entrusted. Sin honored his word, causing Nabu Naid to ascend the Babylonian throne in 555 BCE, and Nabu Naid kept his mother's vow to restore the Ihulhu temple in Haran. He renewed the worship of Sin and Nagal and all the forgotten rites he made anew. And then a great miracle, an occurrence unseen for generations happened. The event is described in the two stele of Nabu Naid, in which he is depicted holding an unusual staff and facing the celestial symbols of Nibiru, Earth, and the Moon. This is the great miracle of sin that has by gods and goddesses not happened in the land since days of old unknown, that the people of the earth had neither seen nor found written on tablets since the days of old, that sin, lord of gods and goddesses, residing in the heavens, has come down from the heavens in full view of Nabu Naid, king of Babylon. Sin, the inscriptions report, did not return alone. According to the text, he entered the restored Ihulhu temple in a ceremonial procession accompanied by his spouse Ningal and his aide, the divine messenger Nusku. The miraculous return of Sin from the heavens raises many questions, the first one being where in the heavens he had been for five or six decades. Answers to such questions can be given by combining the ancient evidence with the achievements of modern science and technology. But before we turn to that, it is important to examine all the aspects of the departure, for it was not sin alone who became angry and leaving earth went up to heaven. The extraordinary celestial comings and goings described by Adaguppi and Nabu Nai took place while they were in Haran, a significant point because another eyewitness was present in that area at that very time. He was the prophet Ezekiel, and he too had much to say on the subject. Ezekiel, a priest of Yahweh in Jerusalem, was among the aristocracy and craftsmen who had been exiled together with the king Jehoiachin after Nebuchadnezzar's first attack on Jerusalem in 598 BCE. They were taken forcefully to northern Mesopotamia, settling in the district of the Kabar River just a short distance away from the ancestral home in Haran, and it was there that Ezekiel's famous vision of the celestial chariot had occurred. As a trained priest, he too recorded the place and the date. It was on the fifth day of the fourth month in the fifth year of the exile, either 594 or 593 BCE. 
when Ezekiel was among the exiles on the banks of the river Kyber, and the heavens opened up, and he saw visions of Elohim. What he saw, appearing in a whirlwind, flashing lights, and surrounded by a radiance, was a divine chariot that could go up and down and sideways, and within it, upon the likeness of a throne, the semblance of a man. And he heard a voice addressing him as Son of Man, and announcing his prophetic assignment. The prophet's opening statement is usually translated visions of God. The term Elohim, which is plural, has been traditionally translated God in the singular, even when the Bible itself clearly treats it in the plural as in, quote, An Elohim said, Let us fashion the Adam in our image and after our likeness. The biblical Adam tale is a rendering of the much more detailed Sumerian creation text, where it was an Anunnaki team led by Inki that used genetic engineering to fashion the Adam. The term Elohim, it has been shown repeatedly, referred to the Anunnaki. And what Ezekiel reported was that he had encountered an Anunnaki celestial craft near Haran. The celestial craft that was seen by Ezekiel was described by him in the opening chapter and thereafter as the god's kavod, which means that which is heavy. The very same term used in Exodus to describe the divine vehicle that had landed on Mount Sinai. The craft's description rendered by Ezekiel has inspired generations of scholars and artists. The resulting depictions have changed with time as our own technology of flight vehicles has advanced. Ancient texts refer both to spacecraft and aircraft and describe Inki, Enlil, Ninurta, Marduk, Thoth, Sin, Shamash, and Ishtar, to name the most prominent, as gods who possessed aircraft and could roam Earth's skies or engage in aerial battles as between Horus and Seth or Ninurta and Anzu not to mention the Indo-European gods. Of all the varied textual descriptions and pictorial depictions of the celestial boats of the gods, the most appropriate to Ezekiel's vision of a whirlwind appears to be the whirlwind chariot, depicted at a site in Jordan from which the prophet Elijah was taken up to heaven. Helicopter-like, it had to serve as a shuttlecraft to where full-fledged spacecraft were stationed. Ezekiel's mission was to prophesize and warn his exiled compatriots of the coming day of judgment for all the nation's injustices and abominations. Then, a year later, the same semblance of a man appeared again, put out a hand, grabbed him, and carried him all the way to Jerusalem to prophesy there. The city, it will be remembered, went through a starving siege, a humiliating defeat, wanton Luton, a Babylonian occupation, and the exile of the king and all the nobility. Arriving there, Ezekiel saw a scene of complete breakdown of the rule of law and of religious observances. Wondering what was going on, he heard the remnant sitting in mourning bewailing, Yahweh sees us no more. Yahweh has left the earth. One cannot be certain how or why events occurring in northern Mesopotamia gave rise to a notion in distant Judea that Yahweh too had left the earth, but it is evident that the news that the gods departed had spread far and wide. Indeed, Tablet VAT 7847 states the following in a prophetic section regarding calamities that last 200 years. Roaring, the gods flying from the lands will go away. From the people they will be separated. The people will the gods' abodes leave in ruins. Compassion and well-being will cease. Enlil, in anger, will lift himself off. We have here a document that considerably expands the divine exodus. The angered gods, led by Enlil, flew away from their lands. It was not just Sin who was angered and left. There is yet another document. It is classified by scholars as belonging to prophecy in Neo-Assyrian sources, though its very first words suggest authorship by a Babylonian worshiper of Marduk. Here is in full what it says. Marduk, the Enlil of the gods, got angry. His mind became furious. 
he made an evil plan to disperse the land and its peoples. His angry heart was bent on leveling the land and destroying its people. A grievous curse formed in his mouth. Evil portents indicating the disruption of heavenly harmony started appearing abundantly in heaven and on earth. The planets in the ways of Enlil, Anu, and Ea worsened their positions and repeatedly disclosed abnormal omens. Aratu, the river of abundance, became a raging current. A fierce surge of water, a violent flood like the deluge, swept away the city, its houses and sanctuaries turning them to ruins. The gods and goddesses became afraid, abandoned in their shrines, flew off like birds, and ascended to heaven. What is common to all these texts are the assertions that a. the gods grew angry with the people, b. the gods flew away like birds, and c. they ascended to heaven. We are further informed that the departure was accompanied by unusual celestial phenomena and some terrestrial disturbances. In reality, the departure was related to the return of Nibiru, meaning essentially that the gods left Earth when Nibiru came. What had taken place was a gradual buildup of divine anger and disappointment, and the reaching of a conclusion by the Anunnaki that enough is enough, it was time to leave. It all brings to mind the decision of the gods led by the disappointed Enlil to keep the coming deluge and gods lofting themselves into their celestial craft a secret from mankind. Now, as Nibiru was again nearing, it was the Enlil-like gods who planned the departure. Who left? How did they leave? And where did they go if Sin could come back in a few decades? For the answers, let us roll the events back to the beginning. When the Anunnaki led by Inki had first come to Earth to obtain the gold with which to protect their planet's endangered atmosphere, they planned to extract the gold from the waters of the Persian Gulf. When that did not work, they shifted to mining operations in southeastern Africa and smelting and refining in the Eden, the future Sumer. Their number increased to 600 on Earth, plus 300 Ajiji, who operated celestial craft to a way station on Mars from which the long-haul spacecraft to Nibiru could be launched more easily. Enlil, Inki's half-brother and rival for the succession, came and was put in overall command. When the Anunnaki, toiling in the mines, mutinied, Inki suggested that a primitive worker be fashioned. It was done by genetically upgrading an existing hominid. And then the Anunnaki began to take the daughters of Adam as wives and had children by them, with Inki and Marduk breaking the taboo. When the deluge came, the outraged Enlil said, Let mankind perish, for the wickedness of man was great on the earth. But Inki, through a Noah, frustrated the plan. Mankind survived, proliferated, and in time was granted civilization. The deluge that swept over the earth flooded the mines in Africa but exposed a motherload of gold in the Andes Mountains of South America, enabling the Anunnaki to obtain more gold more easily and quickly, and without the need for smelting and refinement. It also made it possible to reduce the number of Anunnaki needed on earth. On their state visit to Earth circa 4000 BCE, Anu and Antu visited the post-diluvial gold land on the shores of Lake Titicaca. The visit served as an opportunity to begin reducing the number of Nibiruans on Earth. It also approved peace arrangements between the rival half-brothers and their warring clans. But while Inki and Enlil accepted the territorial divisions, Inki's son Marduk never gave up the strife for supremacy that included control of the old space-related sites. It was then that the Enlilites began to prepare alternative spaceport facilities in South America. When the post-alluvial spaceport in the Sinai was wiped out with nuclear weapons in 2024 BCE, the facilities in South America were the only ones left entirely in Enlilite hands. And so, when the frustrated and disgusted Anunnaki leadership decided that it was time to leave, some could use the landing place, 
Others, perhaps with a large last haul of gold, had to use the South American facilities near the place where Anu and Antu stayed during their visit to the area. The place, now called Pumu Pumku, is a short distance from a shrunken Lake Titicaca, but was then situated on the lake's southern shore with harbor facilities. Its main remains consist of a row of four collapsed structures, each made of a single hollowed-out giant boulder. Each such hollowed-out set of chambers was completely inlaid inside with gold plates held in place by gold nails, an incredible treasure hauled off by the Spaniards when they arrived in the 16th century. How such dwellings were so precisely hollowed out of the rocks, and how four huge rocks were brought to the site remain a mystery. There is yet another mystery at the site. The archaeological finds in the place included a large number of unusual stone blocks that were precisely cut, grooved, angled, and shaped. One does not need an engineering degree to realize that these stones were cut, drilled, and shaped by someone with incredible technological capability and sophisticated equipment. Indeed, one would doubt whether stones could be shaped so nowadays. The puzzle is compounded by the mystery of what purpose these technological miracles serve. If it was to serve as casting dice for complex instruments, what and whose were those instruments? Clearly, one can think only of the Anunnaki as possessing both the technology to make those dies and to use them on their end products. The main outpost of the Anunnaki was situated a few miles inland at a site now known as Tiwanaku. The principal above-ground structures in Tiwanaku include the Akapana, an artificial hill riddled with channels, conduits, and sluices. The tourist favorite is a stone gateway known as the Gate of the Sun, a prominent structure that was also cut from a single boulder with some of the precision exhibited at Pumapunku. It probably served an astronomical purpose and undoubtedly a calendrical one, as the carved images on the archway indicate. Those carvings are dominated by the larger image of the god Viracocha holding the lightning weapon that clearly emulated the Near Eastern god Adad or Teshub. The Gate of the Sun is so positioned that it forms an astronomical observation unit with the third prominent structure at Tiwanaku called the Kalasaseya. It is a large rectangular structure with a sunken central courtyard and it's surrounded by standing stone pillars. Archaeologist author Poznanski's suggestion that the Kalasasea served as an observatory has been confirmed by subsequent explorers. His conclusion, based on archaeoastronomy guidelines, that the astronomical alignments of the Kalasasea show that it was built thousands of years before the Incas, was so incredible that German astronomical institutions sent teams of scientists to check this out. Their report and subsequent additional verifications affirm that the Colossus orientation unquestionably matched the Earth's obliquity either in 10,000 BCE or 4,000 BCE. The earlier date was soon after the Deluge when the gold obtaining operations began there, and the later date was when Anu visited, so both dates match the activities of the Anunnaki there and the evidence of the presence of the Enlilite gods is all over the place. Archaeological, geological, and mineralogical research at the site and in the area confirmed that Tiwanaku also served as a metallurgical center. Based on various finds and the images on the Gate of the Sun, and their similarity to depictions in ancient Hittite sites in Turkey, it is suggested that the gold and tin obtainment operations there were supervised by Ishkur, also known as Adad, Enlil's youngest son. His domain in the Old World was Anatolia, where he was worshipped by the Hittites as Teshub, the weather god whose symbol was the lightning rod. Such a symbol is carved on a steep mountainside and can be seen from the air from out in the ocean in the Bay of Paracas, which is downhill from Tiwanaku. Nicknamed the Candelabra, the symbol is 420 feet long and 240 feet wide, and its lines, which are 5 to 15 feet wide, have been etched into the hard rocks to a depth of about 2 feet, and no one knows by whom, and when, or how, 
unless it was a dad himself who wanted to declare his presence. To the north of the bay, inland in the desert between the Ingenio and Nazca rivers are located the Nazca Lines. The drawings are so huge that they make no sense at ground level, but when viewed from the air clearly represent known and imaginary animals and birds. The drawings were made by removing the topsoil to a depth of several inches and were executed with a unicursal line, a continuous line that curves and twists without crossing over itself. Anyone flying over the area invariably concludes that someone, airborne, has used a soil blasting device to doodle on the ground below. Directly relevant to the subject of the Anunnaki departure, however, is another even more puzzling feature of the Nazca lines, actual lines that look like wide runways. Straight without fault, these flat stretches, sometimes narrow, sometimes wide, sometimes short, sometimes long, run straight over hills and vales no matter the shape of the terrain. There are at least 740 straight lines, sometimes combined with triangular trapezoids. They frequently crisscross each other without rhyme or reason, sometimes running over the animal drawings revealing that the lines were made at different times. Though the wider lines look like airport runways on which wheeled aircraft rolled to take off or to land, this is not the case here, if only because the lines are not horizontally level. They run straight over uneven terrain, ignoring hills, ravines, and gullies. Indeed, rather than being there to enable takeoff, they appear to be the result of takeoffs by craft taking off and leaving on the ground below lines created by their engine's exhaust. That the celestial chambers of the Anunnaki did emit such exhaust is indicated by the Sumerian pictograph, read Dinjur, for the space gods. This is the probable solution of the puzzle of the Nazca lines. Nazca was the last spaceport of the Anunnaki. It served them after the one in Sinai was destroyed, and then it served them for the final departure. The inevitable conclusion must be that from at least 610 BCE through probably 560 BCE, the Anunnaki gods were methodically leaving planet Earth. Where did they go as they lifted off Earth? It had to be, of course, a place from which Sin could return relatively soon once he had changed his mind. The place was the good old way station on Mars from which the long-distance spaceships raced to intercept and land on the orbit in Nibiru. Sumerian knowledge of our solar system included references to the use of Mars by the Anunnaki as a way station. It is evidenced by a remarkable depiction on a 4,500-year-old cylinder seal now in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia, that shows an astronaut on Mars, the sixth planet, communicating with one on Earth, the seventh planet, counting from the outside in, with a spacecraft in the heavens between them. Benefiting from Mars' lower gravity compared to that of Earth, the Anunnaki had found it easier and more logical to first transport themselves and their cargoes in shuttlecraft from Earth to Mars and their transfer to reach Nibiru and vice versa. So, it would seem that Mars was the first close-by destination of the departing gods as confirmed by the relatively quick return of Sin. This leaves us with some interesting questions at this point. Who else departed Earth? and who stayed behind. Mankind's recollection of landmark events in its past includes tales deemed universal in that they have been part of the cultural or religious heritage of peoples all over the earth. Tales of a first human couple, of a deluge, or of gods who came from the heavens belong to that category. So do tales of the gods' departure back to the heavens. Of particular interest to us are such collective memories by the peoples and in the lands where the departures had actually taken place. We have already covered the evidence from the ancient Near East. It also comes from the Americas, and it embraces both Enlilite and Inkyite gods. In South America, the dominant deity was called Viracocha, creator of all. The Aymara natives of the Andes said his abode was in Tiwanaku, 
in that he gave the first brother-sister couples a golden wand with which to find the right place to establish Cusco, the site for the observatory of Machu Picchu and other sacred sites. And then, having done all that, he left. The grand layout, which simulated a square ziggurat with its corners oriented to the cardinal points, then marked the direction of his eventual departure. We have identified the god of Tiwanaku as Tushub, or a dad, of the Hittite slash Sumerian pantheon, Enlil's youngest son. In Mesoamerica, the giver of civilization was the winged serpent, Quetzalcoatl. We have identified him as Inki's son, Thoth, of the Egyptian pantheon. Ningazita to the Sumerians, and as the one who, in 3113 BCE, brought over his African followers to establish civilization in Mesoamerica. Though the time of his departure was not specified, it had to coincide with the demise of his African protégés, the Olmecs, and the simultaneous rise of the native Mayas, circa 600 to 500 BCE. The dominant legend in Mesoamerica was his promise when he departed to return on the anniversary of his secret number 52. And so it was by the middle of the first millennium BCE, in one part of the world after another, that mankind found itself without its long worshipped gods. And before long, the question began to preoccupy mankind, will they return? Like a family suddenly abandoned by its father, mankind grasped for the hope of a return. Then, like an orphan needing help, mankind cast about for a savior. The prophets promised it would surely happen at the end of days. At the peak of their presence, the Anunnaki numbered 600 on Earth plus another 300 Ijiji based on Mars. Their number fell after the deluge and especially after Anu's visit circa 4000 BCE. Of the gods named in the early Sumerian text and in long god list, few remained as the millennia followed each other. Most returned to their home planet, but some died on Earth. We can mention the defeated Zu and Seth, the dismembered Osiris, the drowned Dumuzi, and the nuclear-afflicted Baal. The departures of the Anunnaki gods as Nibiru's return loomed were the dramatic finale. The awesome times when the gods resided in sacred precincts in the people's cities, when a pharaoh claimed that a god was riding along in his chariot, when an Assyrian king boasted of help from the skies, were over and gone. Already in the days of the prophet Jeremiah, the nations surrounding Judea were mocked for worshipping not a living god, but idols made by craftsmen of stone, wood, and metal. Gods who needed to be carried, for they could not walk. With the final departure taking place, who of the great Anunnaki gods remained on earth? To judge by who was mentioned in the text and inscriptions from the ensuing period, we can be certain only of Marduk and Nabu of the Inkiites and of the Enlilites, Nanar, his spouse Ningal, and his aide Nusku, and probably also Ishtar. On each side of the great religious divide, there was now just one sole great god of heaven and earth, Marduk for the Inkiites and Nanar or Sin for the Enlilites. The story of Babylonia's last king reflected the new circumstances. He was chosen by Sin in his cult center Haran, but he required the consent and blessing of Marduk in Babylon and the celestial confirmation by the appearance of Marduk's planet, and he bore the name Nabu Naid. The divine co regium might have been an attempt at dual monotheism but its unintended consequence was to plant the seeds of Islam. The historical record indicates that neither gods nor people were happy with these arrangements. Sin, whose temple in Haran was restored, demanded that his great ziggurat temple in Ur should also be rebuilt and become the center of worship, and in Babylon the priests of Marduk were up in arms. 
A tablet now in the British Museum is inscribed with a text that scholars have titled Nabu Naid and the Clergy of Babylon. It contains a list of accusations by the Babylonian priest against Nabu Naid. The charges ran from civil matters, neglect of the economy, and lack of public safety to the most serious charges, religious sacrilege. He made an image of a god which nobody had seen before in the land. He placed it in the temple, raised it upon a pedestal. He called it by the name of Nanar. With lapis lazuli he adorned it, crowned it with a tiara in the shape of an eclipsed moon made for its hand the gesture of a demon. For this sacrilege, the Babylonian priest forced Nabu Naid to leave Babylon and go into exile in a distant region. It is a historical fact that Nabu Naid indeed left Babylon and named his son Belsar Uzer, the Belzarzer of the Bible book of Daniel as regent. The distant region to which Nabu Naid went into self-exile was Arabia. As various inscriptions attest, his entourage included Jews from among the Judean exiles in the Haran region. His principal base was at the place called Tima, a caravan center in what is now northwestern Saudi Arabia that is mentioned several times in the Bible. Recent excavations there have uncovered cuneiform tablets attesting to Nabu Naid's stay. He established six other settlements for his followers. Five of the towns were listed a thousand years later by Arabian writers as Jewish towns. One of them was Medina, the town where Muhammad founded Islam. The Jewish angle in the Nabu Naid tale has been reinforced by the fact that a fragment of the Dead Sea Scrolls found in Qumran on the shores of the Dead Sea mentions Nabu Naid and asserts that he was suffering in Tima from an unpleasant skin disease that was cured only after a Jew told him to give honor to the God Most High. All that has led to speculation that Nabu Naid was contemplating monotheism. But to him, the God Most High was not the Judean's Yahweh, but his benefactor, Nanar, or Sin, the moon god, whose crescent symbol has been adopted by Islam. And there is little doubt that its roots can be traced back to Nabu Naid's stay in Arabia. Sin's whereabouts fade out of Mesopotamian records after the time of Nabu Naid. Texts discovered at Ugarit, a Canaanite site on the Mediterranean coast in Syria now called Rosh Shamra, describe the moon god as retired with his spouse to an oasis at the confluence of two bodies of water near the cleft of the two seas. The Ugarit text called the moon god El, simply God, a forerunner of Islam's Allah, and his moon crescent symbol crowns every Muslim mosque. And, as tradition demands, the mosques are flanked, to this day, by minarets that simulate multi-stage rocket ships ready to be launched. The last chapter in the Nabu Naid saga was linked to the emergence on the scene of the ancient world of the Persians, a name given to a medley of peoples and states on the Iranian plateau that included the olden Sumerian Anshan and Elam and the land of the later Medes, who had a hand in the demise of Assyria. It was in the 6th century BCE that a tribe called Achaemenes emerged from the northern outskirts of those territories, seized control, and unified them all to become a mighty new empire. Though deemed to racially be Indo-Europeans, their tribal name stemmed from that of their ancestor, Hakam Anish, which meant wise man in Semitic Hebrew a fact that some attribute to the influence of Jewish exiles from the ten tribes who had been relocated to that region by the Assyrians. Religiously, the Achaemen Persians apparently adopted a Sumerian Akkadian pantheon akin to its Hurrian Mitannian version, which was a step to the Indo-Aryan one of the Sanskrit Vedas, a mixture that is conveniently simplified by just stating that they believed in a god most high whom they called Ahura Mazda truth and light. In 560 BCE, the Achaemen king died and his son Karash succeeded him on the throne and made his mark on subsequent historic events. We call him Cyrus. The Bible called him Koresh and considered him Yahweh's emissary for conquering Babylon 
overthrowing its king and rebuilding the destroyed temple in Jerusalem. Cyrus consolidated into a vast Persian empire all the lands that had once been Sumer and Akkad, Mari and Mitanni, Hatti and Elam, Babylonia and Assyria. It was left to his son Cambyses to extend the empire to Egypt. Egypt was just recovering from a period of disarray that some consider a third intermediate period, during which it was disunited, changed capital several times, was ruled by invaders from Nubia, or had no central authority at all. Cambyses, like his father, was no religious zealot and let people worship as they pleased. These religious laissez-faire policies bought the Persians peace in their empire, but not forever. Unrest, uprisings, and rebellions kept breaking out almost everywhere. Especially troublesome were growing commercial, cultural, and religious ties between Egypt and Greece. The Persians could not be pleased with those ties, above all because Greek mercenaries were participating in local uprisings. Of particular concern were also the provinces in Asia Minor, at the western tip of which Asia and the Persians faced Europe and the Greeks. There, Greek settlers were reviving and reinforcing olden settlements. The Persians, on their part, sought to ward off the troublesome Europeans by seizing nearby Greek islands. The growing tensions broke into open warfare when the Persians invaded the Greek mainland and were beaten at Marathon in 490 BCE. A Persian invasion by sea was beaten off by the Greeks in the Straits of Salamis a decade later, but the skirmishes and battles for control of Asia Minor continued for another century. Even as in Persia king followed king, and in Greece Athenians, Spartans, and Macedonians fought one another for supremacy. In those double struggles, one among the mainland Greeks, the other with the Persians, the support of the Greek settlers of Asia Minor was very important. No sooner did the Macedonians win the upper hand on the mainland that their king Philip II sent an armed corps over the Straits of Hellespont, today's Dardanelles, to secure the loyalty of the Greek settlements. In 334 BCE, his successor, Alexander the Great, heading an army 15,000 strong, crossed into Asia at the same place and launched a major war against the Persians. Alexander's astounding victories and the resulting subjugation of the ancient East to Western, or Greek domination, have been told and retold by historians, starting with some who had accompanied Alexander, and need no repetition here. What does need to be described are the personal reasons for Alexander's foray into Asia and Africa. For apart from all geopolitical or economic reasons for the Greek-Persian Great War, there was Alexander's own personal quest. There had been persistent rumors in the Macedonian court that not King Philip, but a god, an Egyptian god, was Alexander's true father, having come to the queen, Olympias, disguised as a man. With a Greek pantheon that derived from across the Mediterranean Sea and headed, like the Sumerian Twelve, by twelve Olympians, and with tales of the gods that emulated the Near Eastern tales of the gods, the appearance of one such god in Macedonian court was not deemed an impossibility. With court shenanigans that involved a young Egyptian mistress of the king and marital strife that included divorce and murders, the rumors were believed first and foremost by Alexander himself. A visit by Alexander to the oracle in Delphi to find out whether he was indeed the son of a god and therefore immortal only intensified the mystery. He was advised to seek an answer at an Egyptian sacred site. It was thus that as soon as the Persians were beaten in the first battle, Alexander, rather than pursuing them, left his main army and rushed to the oasis of Siwa in Egypt. There, the priest assured him that he indeed was a demigod, the son of the ram god Amon. In celebration, Alexander issued silver coins showing him with ram's horns. But what about the immortality? While the course of the resumed warfare and Alexander's conquests have been documented, his personal quest for immortality is mostly known from sources deemed to be embellished fact with legend. The Egyptian priest directed Alexander from Siwa to Thebes, 
There on the Nile River's western shore, he could see in the funerary temple built by Hatshepsut the inscription attesting to her being fathered by the god Amun, who he came to her mother disguised as the royal husband, exactly like the tale of Alexander's demigod conception. In the great temple of Ra Amun in Thebes, in the Holy of Holies, Alexander was crowned as Pharaoh. Then, following the directions given in Siwa, he entered subterranean tunnels in the Sinai Peninsula, and finally he went to where Amun-Ra, aka Marduk, was, to Babylon. Resuming the battles with the Persians, Alexander reached Babylon in 331 BCE and entered the city riding in his chariot. In the sacred precinct, he rushed to the Esagil Ziggurat temple to grasp the hands of Marduk as conquerors before him had done. But the great god was dead. According to the sources, Alexander saw the god lying in a golden coffin, his body immersed or preserved in special oils. True or not, the facts are that Marduk was no longer alive and that his Esagil ziggurat was, without exception, described as his tomb by subsequent established historians. Scholars called Chaldeans, who had gained a great reputation in astrology and who were accustomed to predict future events by a method based on age-old observations, warned Alexander that he would die in Babylon but could escape the danger if he re-erected the tomb of Bellows which had been demolished by the Persians. Entering the city anyway, Alexander had neither the time nor the manpower to do the repairs and indeed died in Babylon in 323 BCE. The first century BCE historian geographer Strabo, who was born in a Greek town in Asia Minor, described Babylon in his famed geography. Its great size, the hanging garden, that was one of the seven wonders of the world. Its high buildings constructed of baked bricks and so on, and said this in section 16.1.5. Here too is the tomb of Belos, now in ruins, having been demolished by Xerxes as it is said. It was a quadrangular pyramid of baked bricks, not only being a stadium in height, but also having sides a stadium in length. Alexander intended to repair this pyramid, but it would have been a large task and would have required a long time so that he could not finish what he had attempted. According to this source, the tomb of Bel, or Marduk, was destroyed by Xerxes, who was the Persian king and ruler of Babylon from 486 to 465 BCE. Strabo, in Book 5, had earlier stated that Belos was lying in a coffin when Xerxes decided to destroy the temple in 482 BCE. Marduk's son Nabu also vanished from the pages of history about the same time, and thus came to an end, an almost human end, the saga of the gods who shaped history on planet Earth. That the end came as the age of the ram was waning was probably no coincidence either. With the death of Marduk and the fading away of Nabu, all the great Anunnaki gods who had once dominated Earth were gone. With the death of Alexander, the real or pretended demigods who linked mankind to the gods were also gone. For the first time since Adam was fashioned, man was without his creators. So now we get to the final two questions. Will the Anunnaki return, and if so, when will they return? The answers are in part two.